This is intended to be a, it's a slight um, sort of change of gear from most of the talks that are technical in nature. But I thought that it would be a, that DebConf would be a really good uh, opportunity to actually show you guys how we are using Debian for real to do cutting edge scientific research, which hopefully benefits millions of people across the world. There is some technical stuff here a little bit, but there's also some general description of what the Sanger Institute is, what it does, um, and generally the sort of things we're trying to do. So f before I, I wasn't quite sure how to target this, so one thing I'd like a, a sh before we start is a sort of show of hands, if you can, how many of you are sort of vaguely involved in bioscience, bioinformatics, medical research, that sort of thing. Okay, so we do have a few, but the majority are not. So, okay, I'm gonna have to, um, please, those who are, please excuse me if I have to explain any, any sort of stuff that feels like uh, teaching my grandmother to suck eggs for you guys. But um, So the two of us that are giving the presentation, uh, so we're both, it's myself, Tim Cutts, and this is Simon Kelly. We're both members of the uh, Sanger Institute's Informatics Systems Group. We're a sort of uh, internal consultancy group, if you like, within the Institute. Our job is to provide a, um, a sort of interface between the regular uh, systems guys and the scientists. Um, that's why I have doctor in front of my name. I'm actually a, originally a, sci a biological scientist by training. You know, geeking is just my hobby. Um, so. Um, Anyway, but Simon and I are both Debian developers as well, so it's a uh, it's sort of quite good fortune that we're you know that gives us a good opportunity to be here. Anyway, so here's here's how the talk's basically going to work. Um, if my okay, so I'm going to I'm going to start with an introduction to the Sanger Institute, um, and a, then a little bit about sort of why we chose to use Debian and exactly where we use it because we don't use it sort of f for absolutely everything, but you know we do use it in a, a wide range. Um, I'm going to talk about Ensemble, which is the Sanger Institute's sort of flagship uh, data product that we give out, um, and is a, a sort of interesting example of the sort of high-performance computing work that we do, and that that's, that is built entirely out on Debian. Uh, for those of you who are hardware geeks, we'll, you'll get a nice picture. There's some pretty pictures of some nice hardware porn for you to look at. Um, and then Simon will talk about... Uh, the Lustre open source cluster file system that we use. In fact, I'm, I'm going to steal this thunder here a bit, but we don't actually use the open source version of Lustre. We use HP's um, commercially supported version of Lustre, but it is still a, an open source product underneath. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting little story of how we've sort of shoehorned that to make it work with Debian. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a bit about, you know, we're, we're running several hundred um, nodes. Um, on, on Debian, and so I'm going to talk a bit about sort of how we install, how we install this stuff, and, and how we configure and manage it. So about the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, which from now on we'll probably refer to mostly as Wootsie because it's easier to say. So it's funded by the Wellcome Trust, a big charitable organisation, and its original purpose was to uh, participate in the public version of the Human Genome Project. Um, it's now um, diversifying into sequencing a large number of other um, genomes of disease organisms and other um, mammals and other vertebrates. I think we do about, Ensemble now is about 25 genomes, something like that, um, that scientists can download and compare and so on. And a large part of this is once you've got, a, once you've got a, an animal's DNA sequence uh, is what we call annotating it, so actually sort of marking on it what it actually does. Um, there's a bunch of disease research projects going on, particularly into, into diseases which affect large portions of the population, especially in uh, the developing world. So we've got uh, research projects on um, plague, malaria, and, and diseases of that nature. And the thing that should appeal to everybody who's involved in Debian, because it's a similar sort of philosophy, is that everything we do is given away for free um, for people to do what they like with it. So this is where we work, uh, the Wellcome Trust Genome Campus. And part of the reason why I'm showing you what a nice and green and beautiful place it is, is that we're recruiting. 
So if, if, if you like the look of the stuff that we described today, you can come and talk to us afterwards because uh, we need a couple more sysadmins. So. so there's the Solston building, which contains uh, labs and offices and all that sort of stuff. And the West Pavilion, that little room at the end there, which is where all of the um, DNA sequences live for the production sequencing operation, which, which goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So this isn't just an academic research institute. There's a certain degree of, um, of almost industrial scale work going on here. That's our brand new data center, 1,000 square meters of machine room. Very nice little piece of, uh, of uh, building there. Uh, the offices that Simon and I live in are just in front of it. Uh, we share the site with the European Bioinformatics Institute, which those of you who are other um, biological people will know about. Um, we have a nice restaurant, gym, um, so you can work off the food you've just eaten. Um, and there's even a nature reserve. Uh, the Wellcome Trust are sort of very keen to show off their green credentials, so a lot of the land that they use is, has been maintained as a, as a nature reserve. Um, and there's also a conference centre. But most important, if we change the uh, if we change the view of the slightly, is the there's a nice pub just nearby. So we're absolute, um, which is within staggering distance. So that's great. So what we initially did, the genome, uh, the human genome project, it's allegedly finished. Um, this sort of phrase it completed in April 2003. Well. The human genome is one of these things where you say, well, what do you mean by finished? And actually, it's continually being revived even, er, uh, revised even today. Um, but um, the, the Sanger Institute was the biggest single contributor to the public human genome project. You can, you know, so I, I'm sort of flag waving a bit there. But I mean, actually, if you toss up the amount the American labs did, they did more than us. But in terms of a single institute, we've done more of it than anybody else. And as you can see, that involved storing quite a bit, generating and storing a fair bit of, um, of, of raw sequencing data, which the scientists currently are insisting on keeping um, because you know, they go, well, we never know when we might need it again. Um, and this is a problem that we're about to get in spades. Um, I'm just going to sort of skip past the next one, but it's a sort of, uh, is that even remotely readable to you guys down there? It probably isn't. Um, it's just a, a, a chart of the various sorts of work that we're doing, as well as the sequencing. But the, but how it sort of translates. How, how does my laser work? Hey, does it work? Only just. Um, so you, I've sort of color coded these things. Um, I apologise to people who have red green color blindness. I've just realised this is going to look awful. Um, but anyway, the, the square boxes up here are the sort of laboratory techniques. So we've got things like the the regular genome sequencing. Uh, we've got types of um, sequencing which are looking for variations in human DNA so we can hopefully develop methods for um, things like targeted drugs and so on. Um, we've got microarray expression data. We've got um, some hist automated histology, so uh, looking at exactly how certain genes and proteins are expressed. So these are uh, general mechanisms for generating data, which is why they're in this sort of square box. And then we have huge amounts of automated processing that we would then want to do on these things. And this is why, of course, we end up needing vast numbers of computers. And eventually, all of this stuff goes into databases, which is used for the disease research, but is also slapped out onto the internet for you, for you to download and read if you, if you feel so inclined. So where do we use Debian in all this stuff? Well, the first place we use it is actually on the desktops. A lot of DNA sequencing software and, and DNA assembly software was originally written on Unix systems. In fact, at Sanger, it was mainly originally written on True64 because at the time they were starting out on alphas, um, Linux's support for large files um, was not complete. Um, and uh, we knew that the human genome is 3 billion base pairs long. So if you want to represent that as a single file, you need something that supports 64-bit file lengths. So, the natural um, assumption 15 years ago was, well, we need to use a 64-bit architecture, so we went, we went for alpha. Which actually leads to some, some interesting code porting problems when we've gone to Linux subsequently, because, of course, we initially went to 32-bit Linux, and everybody's familiar with interesting porting problems of taking 32-bit stuff to 64, but you actually get the reverse as well. You, know, you suddenly find that somebody's assumed that uh, long is always eight bytes. And um, Anyway. So we've got 300 desktops that are running Linux to, to run the, um, some of the, in, the interactive software that people need. 
We've currently got 583 high-performance computing cluster nodes, which have between two and four processors each. It comes to a total of about, currently about 1,600 processors. Um, the website that Sanger produces uh, obviously gets an awful lot of uh, attention from the world in general, so we've actually got over 100 machines that, that, uh, that operate the website in one way, shape, or form. Um, from the point of view of sort of industrial scale stuff, our, our uh, production DNA sequencing has in the last six months been moved onto Debian. It was on True64, um, but it's now you know, entirely run on Debian systems, which is quite nice. Um, and we've also got sort of dozens of, of odd little servers here and there which are doing you know, just random bits of rubbish that people want to do, like MySQL and anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, sorry, I, I may be giving away my personal feelings about MySQL there, but um, anyway. Um, but where don't we use it? Uh, there are, because it's important you know, that, you, that you understand there are places that we don't use it. So we still have quite a lot of legacy True64 stuff around. Um, and obviously, HP don't sell that stuff anymore, and they don't really support it much either. So um, that's all going to go away, and it is all being replaced by. Um, by Debian clusters on, on x86 of various descriptions. We've got around, I think it's about 20, it might be more, Oracle servers. And of course, we're, we've got the usual Oracle support matrix problem. And you can't, uh, you know, if you have a problem with Oracle and you call them up and you say, <laughs> but I'm running it on Debian, they'll go, oh, thank you very much, bye bye. Um, so uh, we have to run that stuff on SUSE, which is a bit, you know, it's okay, but it, it, it prevent, presents us with a little bit of an administration complexity. We also have a couple of SGI Altixes for um, the bits of code where the, the users either are too lazy to or can't work out how to um, run it on a distributed computing farm. Um, and uh, so we've got a couple of those which are still running SGI's version of, of Linux. But as Etch now supports Altixes properly, uh, they will get etch as soon as I can actually persuade the users to give me any time to shut them down and upgrade them. And I definitely do consider putting Debian on them to be an upgrade. Um, and we have about 500 Windows desktops and associated servers, which we're just never going to get rid of. You know, they're just necessary for one reason or another. Although I just sort of forget about that. It's nothing to do with me. So next bit is why did we choose Debian? And there are some sort of non-technical reasons why we chose Debian in particular. Well, Linux and de then Debian in particular. First of all, when HP dropped alphas and True64, we got burned quite badly by that, especially with, with uh, regard to their file system. <coughs> we used the ADVFS file system on True64, which is quite a nice file system. Um, and of course, HP came to us and they said, well, you know, your upgrade path, of course, is to go to HP UX on Itanium, and we will give you um, we will give you ADVFS and all this fun true cluster stuff that you've been used to on True64 on HPUX. And we sort of went, mm, not quite sure that's going to happen. And of course, it turned out that we were absolutely right and that HP have now dropped uh, any plans for, to put those on HPUX. So the fact that we said, no, we're not going to do that, we're going to go to Linux instead is uh, quite fortuitous. And we want to avoid that happening again. And that's one of the reasons why we chose Debian, because the more commercial um, flavors of Linux you know, we could always get burned again if they decide that they're going to change something or they're going to, you know, well, like Red Hat changed their licensing and all this sort of thing, sort of, I'm not interested. If I use Debian, I'm quite safe from that sort of stuff. Um, of course, it's completely vendor agnostic, which is great. It means that we can buy our tin from absolutely anybody. And of course, our head of IT likes that because he can bargain for, you know, whatever good deal he can get from whoever the vendor today is. I mean, we don't absolutely go for the cheapest hardware all the time because that way lies disaster, but you know, it does give us more flexibility. And as I sort of suggested earlier, the open source philosophy that Debian has, that everything has to be properly free, meshes pretty well with the way the Wellcome Trust wants to work. I mean, the whole reason that the Wellcome Trust got involved in the Human Genome Project in the first place was that there were companies like Celera and Insight, which for my sins I used to work for, um, who were trying to sequence the human genome and patent it for money. And you know, there, was a, there was a strong feeling that you know, the human genome belongs to the human race and should not be, um, uh, should not be patentable. Um, I mean, it was questionable whether that would ever stand up in a court anyway, but um, 
nevertheless, the human gene, the human genome project was set up to to start a race to, um, and which we won, to to get that data into the into the public domain. And another technical reason, really, is that there were three Debian developers in the systems team at Sanger already, Simon, myself, and Dave Holland, and we just said, well, <laughs> we're familiar with this and we like it, so we're going to go with it. Um, and uh, as I suggested earlier, the Red Hat licensing change uh, was actually a major, because the, the first time we went to Linux, it was Red Hat, um, because that was, that was the sort of the comfortable thing to do for the management. Not for us, but for the management. It's like, yes, we can cope with Red Hat, because we we've heard of that. Um, but of course, Debian has, has you know, increased its, its, uh, its um, perception quite markedly since then. But of course, there were a lot of technical reasons uh, why, we liked, uh, why we liked Debian. Um, everything just, just worked for a start, most of the time, anyway. So large file support was much more complete in, uh, in Debian than in, in Red Hat uh, quite early on. Um, I got I've got fed up with noticing that, for example, I remember Red, at one point Red Hat's tar didn't understand 64-bit files, and neither neither did Gzip oh, even didn't. I mean, it was just hopeless. Um, and the other uh, one of our major uh, wins, of course, is is things like the the upgrade path with Debian. You can incrementally upgrade it all the time, whereas Red Hat, you want to go from Red Hat three to four, <laughs> that's a reinstall, isn't it? So. And, one, and a major thing for the server side of things was this SAN multipath stuff. We got that working on Debian years before we managed to get it to work on, on any flavor of Red Hat. Um, and for the servers, getting sort of proper multipath access to our petabyte of SAN storage was, was a pretty important thing. Um, and of course, Ian's uh, package, you know, the stuff that originally started with Ian's package management, but apt and all the rest of it is just so far ahead of any, anybody else's, in my opinion, that it, it's. It, you know, it's a no-brainer. But another good one that uh, appealed to us was hom homogeneity across architectures. You know, we are using all of those four architectures um, in production within Sanger. Um, and we sort of noticed, I mean, I don't know whether it's still the case, but for a long time, Red Hat's alpha version and their, and their x86 version were, were not even remotely in sync. Um, whereas, you know, the whole ethos of the way Debian is built, we have a reasonable guarantee that you know, things are going to be the same on, on all of the architectures, so that's a major plus. And it also gave us an opportunity to make sure that our desktops and our servers were actually running the same operating system, which makes the life of the, of the um, well, most of the time anyway, which makes the life of the, uh, of the programmers much easier because they can just sort of develop their stuff on their, on their desktop and, uh, and just expect it to work on the servers eventually. And of course, Debian's bug tracking system has, has got us out of all sorts of scrapes numerous times. You know, oh, has anybody seen this before? Oh yeah, so they have. So yeah, that's great. So the sort of challenges that we actually face. So we have, as I said just now, we have about a petabyte of, of storage now. Um, and it's growing fast. Uh, the biggest um, in increase in our storage requirements at the moment is we're just starting to put into place a new sequencing, te sequencing technology. Now, one of these machines, these new machines, produces as much DNA sequence as 100 of our previous generation of technology. Um, and we're about to buy 20 of these buggers. Um, and they, each one generates, what's the figure, Simon, can you remember? About a couple of terabytes a week? of raw data, something like that. Anyway, it's an immense amount of raw data that we've got to find some way of actually doing something with. And of course, as I said at the beginning, the scientists actually like to keep this stuff forever. Um, to which we're actually, I think we finally said, yeah, this is enough. You cannot keep this stuff forever anymore. The storage will just cost way too much money. And you know, just, how long is it gonna take, if we do have a, God forbid, if we do have a disaster and we need to restore this stuff from backup, how long is it going to take? So, yeah. Um, they also want it all in an Oracle database. So I leave it to you to imagine how interesting it is to... We've already got an Oracle database that is 80 terabytes. I leave it to you to decide how, interest, you know, how difficult... Well, A, how interesting that fact is, and B, how difficult it is to do. Um, another major problem is actually getting sustained I.O. performance. Uh, most of the bioinformatics algorithms that are run commonly on our hardware are pretty I.O. intensive. 
It's one of the other reasons why whenever people ask me, oh, do you do grid stuff? I sort of swear at the G word because I hate it. Um, and, I, and the reason we don't do it generally is that unlike something like SETI at home where your, your job is a fairly small packet of data and you then churn on it for hours and hours and hours, in bioinformatics and sort of genome research in particular, it tends to be a pretty big chunk of data and the job actually only lasts a few seconds. So the ratio is completely wrong for sort of sending data off over a wide area network to, to work out, to, to bring a result back. So we've got this problem that our high performance compute cluster has to be able to sustain very high amounts of aggregate I.O. And of course we've got interesting administration problems. I've now I've now got almost, in total, I think it's almost 2,000, certainly by the time I install the new blades, which are next week, I will have almost 2,000 um, Debian boxes to run. And at the moment, ISG group is four people. Um, and we had, there are about 24 sysadmins on the site in, in total, but uh, half, uh, more than half of those are dedicated to Windows, because of course it requires a lot more admin time than anything else. So let's talk about Ensemble. I, this is where the other uh, biologists who are here can go to sleep because they've probably seen this any number of times. But this is, this is uh, the product that Debian is, that you, that you guys indirectly are collectively creating for the scientific research community. So what you can see here um, is this is sort of a high level view of a portion of the human genome. Um, so you can see this tiny little red window here. You might be able to see it which is what expanded into this panel down here. Um, so this is the whole of human chromosome one, and then you have, um, you can see on, on annotated down here are certain uh, genes. And if you scroll, oh gosh, suddenly got very loud. If you scroll down this page, uh, you get things like this. Uh, so what you can see here, some more detail of the human genome um, data. So each of these tracks, is a particular source of experimental data. So, uh, for example, these are known human proteins here, um, other proteins from other organisms. Um, we've got some uh, expressed D uh, DNA sequences here. Um, and down here are um, some predictions from programs which just start with raw DNA and say, does this look like a gene or not? Um, and then what uh, Ensemble's compute infrastructure does is take all of this raw evidence and condenses it into some predictions of what it really thinks uh, the human genes uh, are in, on this piece of sequence. And as you drill down into this with more successively more detail, you get information like exactly how the human genome sequence was built up from the raw sequencing reads. Uh, there's... Um, things called SNPs here, single nucleotide polymorphisms. This is places where the human genome is varying between individuals um, and is therefore important for scientists to, um, to be able to uh, identify places where there might be a significant change in a disease. Um, these are coded, they're color coded and it says actually down here, which you can't read, but for example, uh, a SNP that's coded in red is one that actually occurs within a coding gene up here somewhere. Um, and it will actually sort of, and so it gives you some ideas of which are the most likely targets straight away. And you can keep going for even more detail. <clears throat> and here we're right down to the base pair level now. So A, C's, G's and T's are up here. And um, predicted protein translating, translation of the DNA. Um, and down here you have uh, what are known as restriction enzyme sites. So these are sort of molecular scissors that if you as a lab scientist want to cut out this gene and, and do some experimentation with it, this information down here tells you which particular set of molecular scissors you need to use uh, to get at it. And finally, there's a system called uh, the distributed annotation system which doesn't have an associated uh, diagram with it here. Uh, and what DAS is, is there is a, um, it, it's an ability for you as a scientist, if you have your own data set which you want to layer over this, you can set up what's known as a DAS server. Um, and it's, it's some sort of, um, I can't remember exactly how it works, it's some sort of uh, XML based um, SOAP type thing, um, which, uh, allows you to layer your own annotation of what you think the genome looks like over the top of this. 
So here's an example of how that, uh, how that, data, how that database stuff is actually built. So we start with um, a database of human genomic sequence, raw DNA, um, and we run some basic uh, analysis on it, mostly using the program BLAST, uh, which everybody who's done any bioinformatics will know about, um, but uh, for the rest of you who don't know what it is, think of it as like, uh, it's sort of fuzzy grep. You know, you, you, it effectively does regular expressions for DNA, but it has some knowledge, oh, and protein, and it has some knowledge about the biology, so it'll be able to go, yeah, those look sufficiently similar that I can say that, there's, that they're either related to each other or they're... Um, so you have, uh, and each of those boxes that you saw on the ensemble diagram there, each of those is effectively the result of a blast job. So that gives you what they call feature annotations, uh, and then they take some uh, expressed sequences, you don't need to know what this really is, and they, they, they then mash all this together in what they call the gene build pipeline, uh, which produces a set of gene structure predictions. So this particular compute pipeline, this one here that they call the raw compute, uh, is very I.O. and integer intensive. Um, so here's an example. So 10 query sequences against an 800 megabytes uh, EST data set. This was done on a, this is quite an old slide. I did this on an alpha server ES45 uh, running True64. So this is on a very fast disk system. Um, but it's still only getting 54% CPU time. It's I.O. bound. Um, so these things require a lot of I.O. and they're doing it all the time. It's not as though it sort of reads the data set and then churns away. It's pretty much continuous. And that entire job took, what is it, uh, a, couple of, a couple of minutes. This particular uh, pipeline, the gene build, isn't quite so bad. It uses rather more uh, compute intensive algorithms and so it scales rather better. Um, but they are both classically parallel, or uh, classic, what, they call, what we call embarrassingly parallel problems. You know, you've just got 100,000 query sequences that you want to compare against the whole genome. Um, and you, they're all independent of each other. So, so this is what the gene build pipeline looks like. I'm not going to go into any detail of this. If any of you are vaguely interested, I can have a go at uh, bullshitting my way through what it actually does. Um, but so each of these uh, rectangles is a complete set of jobs in itself. And as an example of how many jobs this actually takes, um, I, took, did this, I did this quite a long time ago, but so when we were on NCBI release 33 of the human genome, the, this pipeline consisted of 13 and a half thousand jobs. And if we just run it in series on a single one of our compute nodes at the time, which was an 800 megahertz Pentium 3, it takes about one CPU year to do the entire calculation. Uh, now, one thing I didn't point out is that all of that ensemble website is regenerated from scratch every two months for all 25 genomes that we do, using all the latest, um, uh, all the latest evidence, which, is, which gives you some idea of why we need the amount of compute we need. So here we go, some hardware porn for you to all drool over. Um, so this was our very first uh, cluster running True64, because we hadn't quite made the leap to Linux at this point. And it's 460 alpha server DS10Ls. Um, now, in order to get that sort of aggregate, aggregate I.O. bandwidth that we need for Blast to go quickly, uh, what we had to do was put a 40 gigabyte disk in every single node, and then the, the sort of static data sets that we needed to search we just replicate it on, onto every node, so it's searching it on its local disk. Um, that's a bit of a pain in the backside, especially when you're doing it over 100 megabit Ethernet. And it got worse, because my first job, when I, this is when I joined the Sanger Institute, and my first job was, right, we've got, the head of IT said to me, right, we've got two, at the time we didn't have that nice big data center, and they said, we've got two 19-inch racks, and we want you to fit as much compute into two 19-inch racks as you can you can squeeze in. And this is what we did. So first of all, we cheated and we bought 54 U-high racks. Um, and we bought 768 RLX uh, blade servers. So each of these, so you can see there are 24 of them in each 3U chassis here. And each one of them is an 800 megahertz mobile Pentium 3 with a gigabyte of memory and two 40 gig hard drives. 
Um, now, this unsurprisingly has some reliability issues. You know, there are one and a half thousand drives in that two in that two sets of uh, two racks, um, which means that we have to copy this by this time sort of 70 gigabyte data set across all. And of course, because it was a 70 gigabyte, 70 gigabyte data set, we're using a RAID zero stripe as well. So that makes the reliability even worse. Um, Plus, other interesting problems. You know, we've now got over a thousand nodes in the farm. A thousand nodes trying to connect to a MySQL server will destroy it, especially if they're trying to pull uh, reasonable amounts of data. Um, so this was getting a bit unmanageable. So we thought, right, we need to buy sort of chunkier, ch what we sort of called fat blades. So the next generation we bought. 168 of these IBM HS20 blades. So each one of these is a dual gigahertz, uh, dual 2.8 gigahertz Pentium 4 Xeon, four gigabytes of memory, which allows us at last to be able to cache the entire human genome in RAM. That makes things a lot faster. Um, and having a dual gig EU network helps as well. Um, and we were starting to sort of experiment. You can see in the middle of this uh, set of three cabinets, um, with their, we were sort of ex experimenting with some SATA RAID arrays uh, to see if we could avoid having uh, lots of uh, lots of individual spindles. Um, it turned out at this stage that the SATA RAID arrays didn't really work. Their performance didn't scale very well. Um, so generations four and five. So we bought yet another 280 uh, of those same blades as last time. Uh, well, similar, the latest version of them, 3.2 gigahertz now. Boy, do these things run hot. If you stand behind this rack, you know about it. Um, but this time they're 64-bit blades, um, so we're running the 64-bit version of Debian on them. Um, and uh, then we bought, um, we didn't buy two 2 gigahertz Opterons, we bought 200 of them. Um, I seem to have, you know, that's what happens when you prepare the slide the day of the talk. Um, and, to, and we finally came up, started using Lustre, and this is what gave us a final solution to this distribution of this enormous data set to all of these nodes. So we at last have this global file system across all of the nodes where this static data set lives. So no more data pushing with all of its, well, time wasting and, and general flakiness, because it was a hideous Perl script that, around rsync that I'd written. It's not a pretty piece of code. Um, and it's reasonable. The, the, the theory behind Lustre, which Simon is going to start talking about in a moment, is is that it's inherently sort of almost infinitely scalable. As you require more bandwidth, you can just add more uh, nodes to it. Um, oh, I did say. It's, it's, and then we bought yet another lot, 140 more. So now I hand over to Simon to talk about the Lustre bit, and then he'll hand over back to me once he's done. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, so as, as, as Tim has, has very ably um, um, explained to you our problems with, with storage, and we, we wanted to get away from this problem where we had a big chunk of essentially static data that we were replicating a lot across uh, lots of, of machines in our, in our compute farm. And we also had a problem that, that um, we were using NFS to provide a, 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 um, a consistent view of storage for uh, um, for for working data and scratch space and 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 writable storage, which was permanently on the edge of breakdown because an NFS server can't really cope with four or five hundred clients all all hitting it at the same time. So we we looked around all of the of the sort of cluster file systems which were available at the time, which was two three years ago, and at that time, it was only just becoming possible to do this stuff, and there were various file systems that were available, some of, most of which were proprietary, and some of which were available as free software. Um, we eventually came across Lustre, which has the, the is, is, at the time it was, it, was, um, it, had the, it was using the GoScript model where old versions were GPL and the current version was proprietary. Um, it's now GPL for the current version. And it has the, the great advantage that, um, as far as data access is concerned, it's parallelizable to the nth degree because 
the architecture is, is that the metadata for the files exists on one set of storage and one set of servers. Um, so that's directory entries and data about, uh, data about uh, block allocation and all of that stuff. But the actual data is, is smeared across as many what are called objects, object storage targets, uh, which are basically machines, um, network machines with disk behind them. And, and this, the, the storage for the files is smeared across as many of those machines as you want, more or less. And this works in two ways. You can either, you can either distribute whole files, as, uh, you can either work in a in a method where, a whole, where files are distributed between these targets, so any, any individual file is only on one target. That tends to work best when you have large numbers of relatively small files. Um, if you have big files or, or files which are being accessed from a lot of different places, especially for read-only at once, you can actually take a file and stripe it across all of the, all of the object storage targets. So, so the first uh, megabyte of a file is on, on the first object storage target and then the next me megabyte on the next. So the, the, the actual network bandwidth is multiplied by the number of storage targets that you have. Um, we, so so we, we decided that we would go with the, with the Lustre file system and then we had a, another interesting question which was should we use the, um, the free software version of the Lustre file system or should we take something called SFS which is Hewlett Packard's productized version of Lustre. Um, in the end we decided to do that which ha was a very interesting and difficult trade-off on the positive side and in fact the reason that we did it in the end is that, that HP have taken Lustre and um, implemented it on their hardware in such a way that you can build a, this whole cluster in a, um, in a very resilient manner. You can build, build one of these clusters with, with a um, uh, an active passive pair of uh, metadata servers. So if one of these things fails, um, the other one will take over completely transparently. No, basically no IO operations will fail. Um, and if any of the object storage servers fail, each of these, um, it's not indicated on this diagram, but, but each, of the, each of the disks at the back end of here is actually dual ported to two of these object storage servers so that if one of them fails, then the other one in the pair will take over access to that, that data. Um, and none of that was available in the GPL version of, of, of Lustre without an awful lot of implementation effort, which we frankly didn't have the resources to do, whereas HP took this stuff and put it on their hardware, and you can buy the whole lot in a cluster. And if you ask, ask HP really nicely and pay them enough money, they will actually ship this thing into your data center in a rack, all configured and cabled up and everything for this stuff. So in the end, we decided that we would take the, the HP SFS proprietary version of Lustre rather than the, the, the free software version of, of, of the same thing, which gave us all of those big advantages, but unfortunately, we then wanted to run it on Debian, and HP were only providing support for SUSE and Red Hat. So, space, okay. <laughs> so, so, I mean, here's a, here's a diagram of the, um, of the kind of network arrangement that we've got for, um, for connecting these things together, and there's uh, you can see here there's there's the there's the servers, and we have a, a core of 10 gigabit Ethernet, um, and then there's a couple of of um, different gigabit Ethernet ports which connect. Oh, sorry, I brought this back to front. Here's the servers down at the bottom. We have 10 gigabit in the middle, and then lots of uh, lots of clients here. Okay. And I have some graphs of what, we're, what we've seen in real life. So you can push at the top here in the 10 gig core, we've been, we've been seeing consistent data rates out of our, out of our, our storage service of sort of two to, to three gigabits when, when pushed hard. And the bottleneck on this stuff is the, is the number of um, disks and the number of object storage, object storage servers that we currently have. And we think we can probably uh, well, the, plan, the current plan is to double the number of disks behind this stuff and double the amount of storage. So we finally solved the problem that we can't access all of this data fast enough for the number of compute nodes that we have by doing this stuff. Um, okay, this stuff isn't perfect. There are problems with it. Metadata, because metadata operations all go through a single, um, the single metadata machine, they don't scale well. And in fact, it's worse than that because at least some metadata operations including including creating files also need to touch the object storage servers uh, which are attack, uh, which are handling the files so there's a big um, 
there's a, a big win in not striping individual files over multiple object storage servers unless you really need to. Um, yeah, random, random access is slow on these things for, for very similar reasons, especially for files which are striped over multiple servers. So um, for much of what we're doing, that's not a problem because this, this last uh, searching that Tim was talking about basically does, does streaming access to files, so that works very fast and very well. But you can't, it's difficult to do DBM files, it's difficult to, to implement uh, databases over this stuff, for instance. Um, so we still, that we're still using NFS for some things, not all things, but it's, we've replaced most of NFS, on, at least on our, on our compute farm, with, with uh, Lustre. Uh, so this, co this comes back, so the, the problem we have with the HPSFS is that because we've committed to using SFS rather than the open source stuff, we're now third hand in taking software. So, so the GPL version of the software is released and then HP take it and do stuff with it and they're doing development and quality control on it and then they pass it to us and then because, because we want to run it on Debian, we have to take their client kits and their client code and adapt it to Debian. So there's a kind of a three stage um, um, cascade really of new releases of the software which means that we end up running quite old software and at the moment we can't run anything anything later than a 265 kernel, which means that we're going to have problems moving to etch on this stuff until we wait, waited for this cascade to come through. Okay, so it's probably, you know, I mentioned much of this stuff already uh, because we, we, we chose proprietary because of the integration with HP hardware. Um, but we have to do Debian support for ourselves. Um, and the other problem is because uh, HP have, have taken uh, have taken GPL Lustre and they've made modifications to it. They have HP have uh, contracts with the with the U.S. government to run Lustre on on some of the big um, Department of Defense clusters. So they do a lot of tuning, a lot of changes to this stuff, so that we can't even share the effort that we make that we doing, making, Debianizing this stuff with other people who are using GPL Luster because what we're using is different from GPL Luster by the time it's been filtered through HP. Okay. I'll pass that back to you. So the first, the first part of the Sang Sanger's infrastructure that actually went onto Debian was actually the desktops. Well, onto Linux in general. Uh, and that was actually done by a separate team from us as done by our sort of what we call our operations group. So for a while, we had completely separate installation and management infrastructure for our desktops and our servers. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so for example, the desktops were, uh, were using a sort of fairly standard uh, Debian preceding install and then using uh, CF Engine to actually manage the, uh, uh, manage the configuration. And we in ISG were using, well, initially we were using uh, vendor specific tools. So when we had the RLX stuff, we were using their control tower uh, product, which was just a, it's just, it just basically, it, it runs a, it, it pixie boots the machine and um, unpack, for, formats the disk and unpacks a tarball on it. It's really basic, it's image sort of distribution. Um, but more recently, uh, especially with, um, once of course we bought hard, you know, we had different vendors hardware, we had to use something that didn't care about uh, which vendor we were using, so that's why we started using uh, FAI. But we now unified it. Um, this is what I've sort of been spending most of the last couple of uh, months on. <coughs> so we now use Faye to install everything, desktops and servers. Five minutes, sure. Well, this is pretty much the end. Um, uh, but, uh, and we also now use CF Engine to configure everything, SUSE, well, not True64, but every Linux flavor is configured with CF Engine. Um, and we also have a local uh, APC repository for certain customized packages that we want to do. So what have we done with Fay? Well, we've, we've now got a uh, Fay 3, whatever the st stable version of Fay is in Etch, 3.1.8, isn't it? Um, and we're installing both 64-bit uh, and 32-bit clients off the, same, off the same server, which is nice. Um, we had to do a few uh, interesting little tricks because of the way uh, our network guys insist that we deploy desktops so that a machine always has the same host name regardless of which bit of the network we plug it into. So 
Um, so we're using dynamic DNS, um, but the machine has to have a fixed host name. So I've been modifying Faye so that we actually store the name of the machine as the asset tag in the, in the, in the desktop's BIOS. And then we grab that during the Faye install and use that to define the name, but we stick with the DHCP configured uh, IP address. So that works quite nicely. Um, but one of the reasons that we chose Faye and we like it so much is because it's so easy to just get in there and do stuff with it. Um, and especially if, if you're trying a new piece of hardware you've never done before and it all falls over, you can just get in there with SSH and prod about and find out why it's gone wrong. So that's one of the reasons why we've gone to Faye. Um, our sort of principle is that we, we actually, although Faye has some very strong stuff for actually configuring the machine, we don't actually use that generally. We, the way we're using Faye is to basically get the machine to its bare minimum usable state. So, you know, its network is working, its host name is configured, and then we hand the whole lot of the rest of it, including installation of most packages, to CF Engine. So that later on, um, we don't use phase soft update method for, for updating things afterwards. All package management subsequently is done with CF Engine. Um, typical compute in, install time with Fay, just I, I like showing this to Windows uh, administrators because they just can't believe this, you know, that it takes less than five minutes to install a server, and they, they just, uh, <laughs> um, the, the desktops take 30 minutes, and I, I reckon that's in, almost entirely GNOME's fault, but there we go. Um, so we use, and uh, we use CF Engine, as I said, for configuration management across the, across the board. I'm, Starting to have itchy feet about CF Engine. I'm not wild about it. I'm quite interested in, I'd be interested in talking to anybody who's tried Puppet as a replacement for CF Engine. Or oh, there's some shaking of heads. <laughs> okay, it just looked interesting. Okay. Um, and as I say, we don't use, uh, when we do do package management with, um, with CF Engine, perversely, even though I said we don't use Faye to do the package management, I actually stole Faye's idea for doing the package management. Um, so, you know, so we've just got a list of package names that we can just throw at Aptitude and say, there, go and do it. Um, plus, uh, our Faye server and our CF Engine server are on the same piece of hardware, um, which makes an enormous difference in having the whole lot of our configuration information. It's all in one place. It's all under the same CVS control. Yep. And local repository going as quickly as I can now, because my time is up. Uh, so we've got a, we're using an app repository that's made with Deb Archiver, which allows us to sort of shove all sorts of nice things in it. So the sort of things we're doing are custom kernels, Lustre client kit packages. Um, I had to patch CF Engine 2 a bit, so my own patched version of that. Um, and some clustering software, special versions of Heartbeat, a cluster aware version of Cron, things like that. Uh, what are we doing in the future? Going as quickly as possible. So we're about to move the desktop to Etch. Uh, server migration is slower, as you've been told. It's because uh, Lustre support for Etch is going to be a problem. Um, we're going to replace all the remaining 264 stuff with Debian and have a look at um, parallel NFS version 4. I'd be very interested in talking to anybody who's tried that. Um, and a sort of, oops, that was my, my Debian wish list, which you now can't see, which I've actually, I don't really need to show you because I've already talked to Ian about this. We really like a sort of version of dpkg that we could use for um, talking, for, for allowing you programmers to install their own packages without needing root access, but still hopefully being able to depend on certain things uh, that are installed on the system itself. So, anyway, hi, I've raced, raced through the end, but I finished. So, has anybody got any questions, or have you all are you all now asleep? Oh, there's one there. Uh, I can't patch DPKG, but I'm running this Debian mid stuff. Can we do anything for you? What are you missing? In, in perhaps can you use this stuff of Debian mid? Uh, sorry, what's it called? Debian mid is a medical distribution for which also cares for biologists. And okay, so I'm, I'm the packages I'm talking about here are not actually the standard things like Blast and. Uh, Hammer and Cluster W and all this. It, it's locally written software, but the but some you know there there are there are hun, about a hundred or so programmers working on the mm. 
on the development of the, of the genome processing stuff, and they've got their own bits of software that are all have all sorts of complex inter interdependencies, and we really want a deep package like dependency tracking so that if they upgrade something, they know that, well, we can't do that until that's been upgraded as well. That's what, that's what they're after. Do you have anything like that? Yeah, but uh, the problem is, uh, c can we do anything, this admin deal, this is, or, or what, what you described here is a little bit uh, deeper than we can provide uh, regarding packaging. Is there any, because you said you use some software which is not in Debian, can we do some packaging which uh, would li make your work easier or something like that? Um, I... Well, it's, it's worth us talking about it offline, I think. Okay, yeah, um, I think we do it uh, later on. <laughs> Any? So, I'm Luca Capello, a biologist by profession. Uh, just a curiosity, what's the situation with the other genome uh, sequencing centers? They use Debian, they use whatever else? Um, well, most of them used to use True64, like we did. Um, I don't know what they're switching to now. Actually, well, Celera went to uh, IBM and power on AIX. We're being told zero again. Um, so, uh, but I don't actually know what they do. I mean, we have protocols for exchanging the data, but of course from, from that I can't, because that big 80 terabyte Oracle interface has all of their data as well as ours. Um, but I don't know how they generate it. Well, if anybody does have any questions, just come and talk to me afterwards. Awesome.